Thanks very much, Catherine, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, I wa I, I've wanted to write poetry since I was in my early teens, and um, it blighted my adult life because I didn't really have much interest in anything else in terms of a career. Um, but I had a, there were many things I got wrong to start with. And the main one was I assumed in the early days in my teens when I began writing poetry that there was this fancy language for poetry that we all had to use. And that was because we were being taught um, Tennyson and T.S. Eliot and um, Thomas Hardy in school. Uh, and I hadn't been exposed to the really interesting dialects and, and, and language poets at that time. And it was only slowly that I realized that the real way of writing poetry, which communicates with other people and shares feelings effectively with other people, is in quite ordinary language, and especially language that's authentic to us, that, that, that we feel is close to our hearts. And that's where dialect comes in, I think. Of course, the other thing is that writing in dialect can't be translated exactly into, into standard English or any other language. You know, every word and every dialect is its own country, if you like. So what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about voice and dialect. But more importantly, we're going to practice writing in voice and dialect. And I want you to think about words that are special to you in your life, words that you grew up with, uh, phrases that were a, a part of your childhood and still are, um, that may not be in your everyday speech, but are there in the background that say something of the sort of person you are. Um, the great thing about effective poetry is that it's immediate and it, um, it speaks directly to, to the reader or the, or the audience. And ordinary language is the way to do that. And there have been many great proponents of it. Um, when, I was, when I was in my early teens, the interesting thing was, my home language was really Scots in, in a way. A lot of the Scots phrases and, and vocabulary came from my father. But in school, in those days, we were actively taught not to speak Scots. We had to speak what they called standard English, which was this overarching language that everyone was supposed to use. So if I used a Scots word in class, I would be told off for it. And if my pronunciation wasn't exactly as the teacher expected it to be for standard English, for instance, I would say butter because I came from Dundee and I had this glottal stop for teas, you know, and the teacher would, would tell us that you mustn't say butter, it's butter. You know? And so I was in, discouraged from writing in Scots. And when I moved, turned to poetry, that was where it was freed up. Um, one great proponent of speaking in voice and dialect is our former Macker, uh, Jackie Kay. Her first book, which came out in 1991, was The Adoption Papers. And here's actually a copy from then. A wonderful um, examination of being an adopted child. And it's spoken in three voices, this book. The voice of the child, of course. The voice of the adoptive mother and the voice of the birth mother. And one thing she does to differentiate between them, apart from the language, is the typography. So there, there are different type styles for each one. And let me just share screen here if I can. And Catherine will switch that on for me. Not quite yet.
Here's three excerpts from it. And the first thing you notice is they're in, almost in three different typespaces. The first one is the voice of the adoptive mother. And this voice is straightforward. It's entirely factual. There's no fancy writing here. I'll read it out. The first agency we went to didn't want us on their lists. We didn't live close enough to a church, nor were we churchgoers, though we kept quiet about being communists. The second told us we weren't high enough earners. The third liked us, but they had a five-year waiting list. Nothing fancy there. But here's the birth mother now. This is the woman who's given up her infant baby for adoption for reasons that she couldn't control. When I got home, I went out into the garden. The frost bit my old brown boots and dug a hole the size of my baby and buried the clothes I'd bought anyway. A week later, I stood at my window and saw the ground move and swell. You see, this is quite a different voice now because it's, it's more what we'd call poetic. There's phrases like the frost bit my old brown boots and that strange, uncanny image at the end. They saw the ground move and swell. It's, it's eerie and it's almost like a, a, a demonstration of maybe guilt. Who knows? The, the weather's described, the frost is there. So there's description as well as the, the facts being put over. It's quite different. And the third voice is the child herself, this wee girl. My mammy bought me a shop. My mammy says I was a lovely baby. My mammy picked me. I was the best. Your mammy had to take you. She'd no choice. My mammy says she's no really my mammy. Just kid on. And look what's happened here. For one thing, we've moved into broad Scots. That's what the child's speaking, this West Coast Scots. The grammar's also gone out the window, hasn't it? My mammy bought me out a shop. There's a lot of repetition in it. My mammy this, my mammy that, my mammy picked, my mammy had. It's quite a different construction because this is the language of the immediate, if you like. This is the words as they came out, as they seem to come out of that child's mouth. So in one long poem, Jackie Kay has three voices and they're all there for a purpose. They're all there to make these people come to life. I'll just minimize that again and stop the screen share because actually, I'd like you to do some writing now. I'd like you to introduce yourselves to me, to bring yourselves to life. And so if you've got your writing materials ready, a pen and a piece of paper is all we need for this, I'll tell you what we're going to do. This is a really quick exercise because we're going to do something slightly more involved in a minute. I want you to write three I remembers. That's all. And they can be as brief as you like. I remember this. I remember that. I remember that. And each one in some way, perhaps, reflecting on the way you speak and the language that is in your heart. And at the end of it, I just want you to say who you are and perhaps what you're here to do. I'll give you an example. Here, here's me. I remember, take your elbows off the table. I remember going the messages and he's no affy wheel. I remember the enduring murk of school and the sudden wonderful daylight of poetry. I'm John and I'm here to talk about my voice. So that's all you need to do. Dead simple. We'll give you 
Oh, two minutes to write that as quick as you can. You don't need to think about it very much. Just scribble something down. Three I remembers and then your name and whatever and what you're here to do. The bad news is you've just got one minute left. What I've done there is just stuck a couple of the words that and phrases that I used in my introduction in the chat so that people can kind of see them in, in case they don't know them. And other folk can do that as well, of course, if you want to share words that you think we might not know, then go ahead. Okay, I think uh, time's just about up. Um, John, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt a second. Um, can everyone see what John has typed? Oh no, John, you're only typing it to hosts and panelists. Oh, just just, yeah, on. sorry about that. Thanks for letting us know that. that All right. I'll, I'll add those in to the everyday chat. Uh, what's the other one? Oh, the legs. Everyone probably knows these anyway, but uh, it's certainly good to share them. That looks better. The other thing that Jackie Kay said that I loved was she left school and then she went down to England. And we'll look at a poem where she talks about that. And she worked as a cleaner for a wee while, just for a few months. And it was actually for, you, you maybe heard of him, John Le Carre, the novelist, the crime writer. I think it's crime or thriller writer. And she said, everyone who wants to write in voice, who wants to write poetry, should work as a cleaner. Because people carry on with their conversations right in front of you, pay no attention whatsoever. And it's the most wonderful opportunity to eavesdrop, to spy on the way that they talk. I thought that was a great piece of advice. Okay. Would someone like to 
start off and read their three remembers to us. Who's going first? Hi. Hi, Atlas. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, I can read mine. Good. I remember quick sticks from the car to the cinema. I remember in no way, shape or form of my dad's exasperation. I, re I remember smiling at an oak called tree. My name is Atlas and I'm here to listen and live. <laughs> That's lovely. What was that? Quick sticks. Yeah, so it was something my mother used to say, uh, like going to the cinema and I had to get out the car quickly, like quick sticks. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. And I loved an oak called Tree. Oh, and thanks, Atlas. And there's something in the chat from Beth. Would you like to read that out, Beth? Okay. I remember coming for Sarnies. I remember the fray and blanket held over my wee face. I remember reading until the sun came to wake me. I am Beth and this is what I see. Oh, that's beautiful. I particularly love that last line. I remember reading until the sun came to wake me. That's, that's a lovely line. Thank you. The fray and blanket held over my wee face. I remember coming to Sarnies. Sarnies is a word I'd forgotten, actually. This is what I love about this sort of exercise, because it reminds you of the way people should be speaking. Thanks, Beth. That was great. Hi. Hi, can I can hear you. What did you write? Well, I only wrote one, and it was... Um... I remember thinking I would get into deep trouble if I ever painted my nails without asking. I never did. <laughs> go, go and read that again. Go and read that again. I remember thinking when I was younger that I would get into deep, deep trouble if I ever painted my nails without asking anybody. What's wrong never, with that? I never did get into trouble. I don't know why that concept came into my head. But... But this is an important thing about writing. I mean, when, I, when someone when someone has a piece of writing and they begin it with, I remember, we assume that what we're going to get after that is the truth. But remember, we're in the world of poetry and fiction. We're in the world of writing. And it's not necessarily going to be the case. Um, Someone once said about poetry that it needs to be truthful, if not true. And so it might well be that you didn't get into trouble for painting your nails or whatever. But if it works in the piece of writing and it's authentic to the sort of person you are, then that's absolutely fine. It's OK to make it up. I mean, I do it all the time. All it needs to be is truthful enough that people believe it. <laughs> I like that. It, it was it was simple and it was direct, and I would actually want to hear more of that. And I, that's exactly the sort of thing I want. Anyone else like to have a go? I'm enjoying this. Oh, who's that? You'd, um, my microphone isn't working well, but I can type it in the chat. Okay. If you type it, we'll, um, we'll uh, read it out for you, if you like, if, if that would help. And meanwhile, anyone else want to have a go? Hi. Oh, um, are you loud and clear? Um, so, yeah, I didn't exactly do mine about dialect, but um, I remember the warm rain drenching my face like freshly fallen teardrops. I remember the stomach lurching joy as we took off into the air. I remember the frost nipping, not biting at my fingers and toes. 
um, and, and I didn't get um, the last bit. That's all right. Uh, B, could you read it again? Okay. I always like to hear things twice. I remember the warm rain. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> I remember the warm rain drenching my face like freshly fallen teardrops. I remember the stomach lurching joy as we took off into the air. I remember the frost nipping, not biting at my fingers and toes. That's great. Um, it's interesting you say this isn't dialect, but everything really is dialect. Everything is our own way of speaking. And what comes over to me from that is the richness of the language you're using. Is you're using everyday language, but you're using it in a in, in a really rich way. You know, you've got um, simile in there. You know, the like freshly dropped, the 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 warm rain falling like freshly dropped teardrops, uh, the the frost nipping, not biting. You, know, I love the way you echo the Jackie K poem there. It's nipping, not biting. So. The way, the way we speak is our voice. And, and th there's two things we can do. We can, we can, we can develop our own voice and, and speak as, um, as ourselves, if you like, and we can adopt voices as well. And that's something we'll talk about a wee bit later, where we can deliberately say, the way I write is going to change now because I need to say something in a different manner. So we can pretend, if you like, to be a different voice. And we can also have our two voices. So the many writers who will write partly in Scots and partly in English, for instance, partly in one dialect, Shetland dialect, partly in, in, in English or in Gaelic and English, you know, we can have more than one voice. That was great. Thanks, B. And John, we now have Ida Crawford's I Remember Us as well. Right, I'd better read this out then. Ida's. I remember the small whispers of the sea. I remember my mother swearing bubblebach, which means fairies, as the buttons spilt on the floor like minute moons. I remember longing to go through the doors of paradise in Florence. That's wonderful. I love that. I remember my mother swearing bubble black, which means fairies as the button is spilt on the floor like minute moons. You know, it's such a vivid memory that. It's, it's beautiful. And the small whispers of the sea. That's, that's, that's great. That's great work. That's lovely. Ida, I wonder if you could maybe make that um, available to everyone, what you've written as well. That would be great. I'm hoping I pronounced Bobble Bach right. That's Welsh, isn't it? I hope I pronounced that right. Do we have anyone else who would like to share something? Either in the chat or by reading it. I, I prefer reading it loud if we can, because I like to hear your voices. Long silence. <laughs> I think we're good I, think to hear I don't think I'm missing anyone. <laughs> mm. oh, oh, Anna has just said, could could she type mm -hmm. hers? Oh, and Lindsay's just typed hers as well. But yes, yes, Anna, definitely. You type it. Oh, here's Lindsay. I'll read Lindsay's out while we're waiting. I remember. This is your treat and you'll enjoy it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I remember, are we not lucky? I remember, I am Beezers, mind my BCG. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that too. I suppose everyone knows what the BCG was. 
Basile Camille Guin, I think it was what it was called, the inoculation. We'll see if Anna's got hers. Maybe you can do yours, Catherine, while we wait. <laughs> Your microphone's still off. I'm not muted. <laughs> oh, here's Anna's now. Anna, would you like me to read this or will you read it? Again, Anna, do you mind making it so everyone can see it? Is that okay? Oh, yes. I'll read it if you just, yeah, if you just make it so everyone can read it. To everyone. Okay. I remember the shambles of the early morning. I remember the never bothering to get up as dawn broke through my blinds. I remember the rush to school with only a piece of toast in my tummy and my lunch still sitting on the counter. And <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> I love the use of the word shambles, the shambles of early morning. Gosh, yeah. That reminds me of my school days. That, that, I'm going to read it again, actually. I remember the shambles of the early morning. I remember the never bothering to get up as dawn broke through my blinds. I remember the rush to school with only a piece of toast in my tummy and my lunch still sitting on the counter. Oh, that's great, Anna. That's perfect. And there it is for everyone to see. Thanks, Anna. Anyone else? There's a couple of names there I think maybe haven't read yet. Let's see if anyone else fancies giving it a go. The great thing about writing in voice and dialect is that there are no wrong answers. You can never get it wrong because this is the way we speak. Okay. Maybe we'd better move on then. <laughs> right. We'll look again at a bit, a bit more of Jackie Kay's poetry. Um, share screen. Is my screen sharing still on? Yes. Let's see. So this is Jackie Kay writing about moving away from Scotland, moving south into England, but still having that Scots tongue in her mouth for a while. Old tongue. When I was eight, I was forced south. Not long after, when I opened my mouth, a strange thing happened. I lost my Scottish accent. 
words fell off my tongue. Ije, drich, wabbit, crabbit, stummer, tuchter, heedbanger, so ya are, so am I. See you, see mama. Shut your gagey, or I'll give you the malky. My own vowels started to stretch like my bones, and I turned my back on Scotland. Words disappeared in the dead of night. New words marched in, ghastly, awful, quite dreadful. Scones said like stones. Pokey hats into ice cream cones. Oh, where did all my words go? My old words, my lost words. Did you ever feel sad when you lost a word? Did you ever try and call it back like calling in the sea. If I could have found my words wandering, I swear I would have taken them in, swallowed them whole, knocked them back. Out in the English soil, my old words buried themselves. It made my brother, mother's blood boil. I cried one day with the wrong sound in my mouth. I wanted them back. I wanted my old accent back, my old tongue, my dour, sour Scottish tongue, sing songy. I wanted to gie it lally. So that's a poem about about losing your special language, really, losing the language that you grew up with and having to, to, to work to, to draw it back. And she does it, you see, by giving all these wonderful examples of Scots words that she would have grown up with and which, when you live in England, will just gradually go from your vocabulary. The richness of poetry comes from the richness of the language and the vocabulary it's written in. And so you should always be open to drawing in as many sources of your language as, as you can. And you'll notice if you read, um, if you read poetry by our current maker, Kathleen Jamie, there'll often be the odd Scots word in there. It's a poem in English, but the Scots still comes through the like little nuggets of quartz in a hillside, you know. Or if you read um, Jen Hadfield, your main tutor for this course, her poetry is full of Shetlandic sayings and Shetlandic words, and it's just totally enriched by them. So the important thing is to always be aware of the language that we have at our disposal in our writing. And I thought this poem, this um, Jackie Kay poem, perfectly encapsulates that, this idea that we should be constantly looking for our language and saving it. So, what else are we going to do? Well, we're going to do a, a longer exercise now. I'm just going to stop sharing, sharing this for the moment. Well, actually, no, I think I'll, I'll put this away and bring something else up. Now, I hope everyone can see this. Is that kind of clear to everybody? This is a, an interesting thing. It's a page from a Japanese teach yourself English book that came out in the late 19th century, over 100 years ago. And this is all to do with language as well, because at that time, at the end of the 19th century, Japan, which for centuries had been an isolated and um, a kingdom cut off from the rest of the world almost, was forcibly opened up to Western trade. It was virtually a case of the American fleet sailing in and insisting that they open up to trade with the West. And so they needed to learn English quickly. 
And this is one of the ways they did it from, from picture books, really. So these are six, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. These are 42 images and the English words that go with them. And some of them are not quite right, that which is fine. Um, we've got goat down here, spelt not quite right. And we've got creek here, which that looks like crack almost. Um, we've got parrot with a capital R in the middle. Chestnut is missing its T. And there's cutting rice up here and it's missing a T too. But what I love about this is the richness of the images in it. When you look at uh, this starving wolf in the field here, or the, the sulking child with her back turned, and the, the ship with the Japanese flag sailing away, and the wee man waving to shore. So this is called a fashionable melange of English words. And melange just means a mixture. And I think we're going to use it as a self-portrait. We're going to describe ourselves in whichever words we want to use in using these pictures. And yes, you might want to use Scots words. You might not want to use Scots words. It's entirely up to you. You might even want to, you might even want to adopt a voice. You might even want to pretend you're someone else. For instance, could you imagine, let's say, one of these read in the voice of Gollum or another read in the voice of Dobby from Harry Potter. Master has presented Dobby with new clothes. You know, the way that he speaks completely different. And we as writers can take on that sort of language and use it for our own ends. Um, but I want you to choose three of these images and write a self-portrait based on them. And so the title of your piece of writing, your title is going to be self-portrait in three images. You can write that down if you want. So it's almost like a, a painting, self-portrait in three images. And there are various ways that you can do that. You might want to adopt three different voices, one for each image. You might want to do a single poem with three verses, each one of which is one of these images. You might want to adopt that Dobby voice or the, the posh voice or the Scots voice or whatever, and build the self-portrait out of that. Now, it would probably be useful if I give you an example. Let's see if I've got something here. So I'll pick a couple of these and show you the sort of thing you could do, because it's, it's, it's not much that we're writing. We don't need to write a lot, but I will give you more time to do it. So here's three of them. Now, what did I do? The, the chicken. See down at the bottom here, we've got a chicken in the bottom right hand corner. Oh, the utter bliss, the sheer joy of prandial wakefulness, the dawn's voice in my throat, singing light back into the world. So that was a kind of a posh voice. And then, what do we have? What else have we got? Oh, right above it, we've got the deer lying with his back to us. Here's the deer. This is the red deer, of course, because we're in Scotland. S stand for Scotland. See any postcard of the hulls? I'll be on it. Sure as fate. He'd like a TV aerial. Showing the world, ah, that Scotland isn't. So that was in a kind of Scots voice. Um, the crab. The way I speak, the words, I mean. I mean, what the words mean and the glue that holds them to the tongue, they're my words, not yours. They let me walk sideways through the world, out of the old country, into 
to history. So that was three images in three in three different voices. But there's another way you can do it as well. You could just incorporate three of these pictures into one poem. And in fact, you wouldn't even need to stick to three. You can use as many as you like. So here's all three in one poem. And I'm going to use um, what we've got here. The crab down here. Uh, there's somebody, oh, the bath. There's a bath right next to it. I'll just use that. And stars up here, crab, bath, stars. I'm the crab waiting for the tide to change in that tiny bathtub called the ocean. What do I want? What do I want from the world? I want to see the stars, to touch them in the night and feel them burn in my claws down to the bottom of my soul. So, dead simple. Everyone still see that? And I wonder if anyone's got any questions. I'm going to just stop. Let's have a look at the chat. See what people are. Is everyone okay with what they need to do? I'll just stop sharing for a minute before we. Kathleen's okay with it. Um, basically, all you need to do is choose three of those images that I showed you, and it can be any three. And there's another thing, I'll bring it back up in a minute, but you can interpret them as loosely or as directly as you want. I mean, I was really direct. I chose crabs, so I wrote about a crab. But there's, there's one which is... Um, commandant, you know, and you don't need to write about the army, it could be anyone in a position of authority, a teacher, a parent, it really doesn't matter. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a pig, you could talk about greed, um, you could use it as a metaphor if you like. Basically all you need to do is use these pictures and talk about the pictures as part of your self-portrait. So you could pick the boat and talk about a voyage, you know, my life is a journey and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you could choose uh, the stars and, and talk about night, anything you like. They're just elements in your poem and you can use them any way you like. Okay, any more questions before I bring it up again? And we can do the real work. Okay, let's share the screen again. I don't need to find it again. I don't know what I did there. So here we are. And, and let me just, I'll, just for Oriana's sake, I'll give you an, another example. Um, you know, if you choose box, it could be any sort of container you like. You know, this morning when I opened my pencil case, that's you use that square. Blank book could be forgetfulness, or it could be a blank book, that book we have never done our homework in. I'm going to give you, what time is it now? 10 to 5. Uh, I'm going to give you 15 minutes to do this. So that's until 5 past 5. And I wonder if I can see the chat while it's up. I'm screen sharing. Yeah, can I? Oh, yeah. Uh, if anyone's worried about it, just put it in the chat and I'll answer it as best I can. I'll leave the picture up. You have 15 minutes beginning now. And remember, there's no wrong ways of doing this. Self-portrait in three images. So you're writing about yourself or someone who seems to be like you.
Okay, there's just a minute to go. So if you have finished, it's worth having a quick look over it again and tweaking it here and there to see how it flows. Right, I think our time's just about up. Um, Catherine, I think I'll just leave it up on the screen as we do a readback. Would that work? Well, that's that's fine, I think, yes. Yeah, yeah let's just leave it there. Um, and now comes the, the bit I like always best, which is who'd like to read theirs out? Oh, there's Anna. Great. Hi. Hi, Anna. Okay, I'll read my nap. So the first one is, I am but a blank book, my pages white and stiff. Take your simple pencil and save me from this nothingness. And then I did, what did I do wrong? Not and I did nothing. You came thumping down those stairs. Then you was yelling and now I'm greeting. My love, my love, my darling, take this golden band and slip it upon your finger. My love, my love, my darling, take this gift of love from I to you. <laughs> That's great. Oh, Anna, could you do me a favor and please read it again? Okay. And, and read it nice and slowly so I can enjoy it all. That, that was wonderful. <laughs> okay. I am but a blank book. My page is white and stiff. Take your simple pencil and save me from this nothingness. What did I do wrong? Not and I did nothing. You came thumping down those stairs. Then you was yelling and now I'm greeting. My love, my love, my darling. Take this golden band and slip it upon your finger. My love, my love, my darling. Take this gift of love from I to you. That's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, and the three are quite different because the, the, yeah. the first one, the first one is, is the is the poem I would have wanted to write as a poet, isn't it? It's really if if the if the words aren't there on the page, there's nothing, you know. The the blank book that I think you describe it as white and stiff. Uh, yeah. to save you from this nothingness, because if you're not writing, then there's nothing there. That's great. Thank you. And and the third one, I particularly like, because you, you could use that at a wedding. Yeah. And yet they, they all kind of say something about the kind of person they are. Because whether, we, whether we're trying to do it or not, it's always ourselves that goes into our poetry. Thank you. That was lovely, Anna. Thanks so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, you do. Oh, um, will I read yours out then? Because you you've got your microphone issue. The free love sailed a luff from the glisco the cliffs, stiff against the cold grey glistering sea. And by the cold north star, she set her course the way I would, I, the way I find my place on all these oceans, by writing how one star lit up for me. <laughs> so you've got there's the there's the ship. Yeah, um, you've got the cold North Star, and you've got the oceans. It, it it's 
It's wonderful. I'm going to read this again because there's also words in it. Uh, aluf. Now, that's a sailing term, is it not? And one that I don't really know. Sailed aluf. And then you've got the glisk. That's a lovely Scots word. And glistering. It's what aloof comes from. Is that right? I'm going to write that down. Sorry. Aluf. But this is the way we do it. This is... This is this is how we enrich our writing. Is that all the time you're taking, you're you're becoming aware of new words, new ways of saying things, and writing them down. So I've learned a lot today. Thank you, Edith. I'm going to read it again now. The free love sailed aloft from the glisk of the cliffs, stiff against the cold grey glistering sea, and by the cold north star she set her course. The way I find my place on all these oceans by writing how one star lit up for me. And of course, it, it, it reads at first as if it's a poem about sailing and about voyaging. And in a way it is, but it's a metaphorical way as well, because it's another poem about the importance of expressing who we are through words, through poetry. That's great. And aloft means keeping your ship away from the shore. Oh, gosh. And just as we're aloof, keeping ourselves away from other people. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Atlas, yes, please do read yours. All right, hold on just a second, Atlas. I'll get you in there. I'm getting a message saying that not everyone's talking to everyone. I thought you all were now, but... Oh. Perhaps not. I don't know. I, I can't see anyone no. anywhere who's not doing that. So I'm not quite sure what's happening there. Yeah, it seems um, to be a mine that says everyone. Sorry, Atlas. Right. I'll just get to you. Hi. Hi, Atlas. Uh, mine starts with the uh, misspelled goat. Oh, yes. The goat. Gout, goat, gout, gout, goat eating oats, gout eating trout. Sometimes I wonder what it's all about. And I've wandered so far and over such a plain, sometimes I forget even my own name. And sometimes looking at myself in the moat, I no longer see myself as a goat. I see a wolf, sharp and lean and too tired to dream, weak kneed and weak sold, too hungry to chase fall, and falling and staring at the sky, and up in the stars I see myself, I, moon, so high and so far and so bleak and so keen, so fair and so scarred and bitter as a dream, looking down, looking down up above the sky, looking down, watching myself and I. I love that ending. Uh, Atlas, uh, uh, immediately just read it again. <laughs> okay. Gout, goat, gout, gout. Goat eating oats, gout eating trout. Sometimes I wonder what it's all about. And I've wandered so far and over such a plain, sometimes I forget even my own name. And sometimes looking at myself in the moat, I no longer see myself as a goat. I see a wolf, sharp and lean and too tired to dream, weak need and weak sold, too hungry to chase fall, and falling and staring at the sky, and up in the stars, I see myself, I, moon, so high and so far, and so bleak and so keen, so fair and so scarred and bitter as a dream, looking down, looking down, up above the sky, looking down, watching myself and I. That's wonderful. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what I loved about it. First of all, I love the change in tone there is in it because it starts off almost 
comical, doesn't it? The gout and eating, and the goat eating oats, and the gout eating trout, and and it's funny, and that really works. But then it kind of moves to a different level, and you do something which I actually forgot to advise people to do at the beginning of this exercise, but you did it anyway, Atlas, and that is the key to good writing comes from good looking, good observation, and the way that you described that wolf said to me that you really looked at that picture and interpreted it well, because you talk about it being sharp and lean, you know, and think that's exactly all right. And then weak need and weak souled, you know, it's just you encapsulate it perfectly. And then you use lots of um, repetition. So the word soul comes in again and again and again. So this, so that. And looking reverberates through the poem too. And right at the very end, you, you give us this enigmatic finish to the poem, which is myself and I. Myself and I. As if there's not one person here that... that, that Atlas isn't one person. He's actually two people or two halves to him, just like there's a gout and a goat, if you like. I think that's great. For, Thank I've you. written it in 15 minutes. My gosh. Thank you so much. They're great pictures to work with. They're, 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 I think they're very evocative. Yeah, they're, they're wonderful. I always think the monkey looks a wee bit like somebody out of Star Wars. <laughs> like your or something. Oh, Kathleen, yes. Would you like us to read this out, Kathleen? And sorry, you have to go. I just noticed that. That was really wonderful. Okay, Kathleen, I'll read yours out. Let's see now. So we've got the moon in it, and we've got the blank book. Last week, I was out walking, looking, looking at the moon wreathed in a circle of clouds. Before I could get my head around such a thing, it was moving, both the moon and the clouds, that is. And I was, and so was I. Later, I took out my new yellow covered blank book, the one I chose with care the week before on a shopping trip to what passes as the big smoke hereabouts, and began writing my reflections on that moon with a freshly sharpened palomino black wing, hoping to capture something of that looking, something of that moon, something of those clouds, something of the me that was part of a night sky with a moon encircled by a wreath of clouds. That's super. Oh, that, that's, that's super. Um, I mean, first of all, there's, there's lots of great observation in there too. Uh, the one that really struck me, Kathleen, was this part about moving. And, and it, it, you'll, you'll notice that if you're looking at the moon on a cloudy night when there's a bit of wind and the clouds are moving over, you are never sure whether it's the moon that's moving or the clouds that are moving or both are moving and, and so are you, the observer. It, it, it's a strange phenomenon, but that describes it perfectly. And then the next bit I loved was right at the end there, and I, and I want to read the end of it again, because... First of all, you use really strange language. I mean, you've got with a freshly sharpened Palomino Blackwing. What on earth is that a kind of pen or a pencil? I don't care, but it's beautiful. And then the repetition comes in right in this last verse. And you've got something of that moon, something of those clouds, something of the me that was part of a night sky with a moon encircled by a wreath of clouds. And look how clouds and moon all come back into it right at the end, it's all repeated. And you, me suddenly becomes a noun, the me that was part of a night sky. It, it's really beautifully phrased, I think, at the end. And this is another thing 
that you'll maybe notice when you're writing seriously that as we proceed, because remember, this these are all written in 10, 15 minutes. They're really off the top of your head. But as you write, your writing can sometimes subtly change and become what it really needs to become. So in their final stanza is really where the poem is encapsulated sometimes. And it's always a good thing to look through these drafts and see where is the real poem sitting. That was that was wonderful, Kathleen. Thanks so much for letting me read it out. Uh, anyone else? Anyone like to show us the their three? That, that, that's been some great examples we've got there, and you've really done more with these than I expected you to. To be honest. Either if you want to read them out yourselves or put them in the chat and I'll do my best to read them. Oh, thanks. Thanks, B. That'd be great. Progress. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, the three I did were, um, the stars, I kind of did the dog, um, and I did coffee instead of tea, but I kind of feel like that captures the spirit, so. Absolutely, yep. Oh, how I dread those mornings when the stars still glitter and dance. When we stalk down our drive like unfed puppies, only to be jolted back to reality by the scorching hot coffee we were dutifully handed by just as scolding parents. <laughs> that ending's great. <laughs> uh, could you just read it again, please? Oh, how I dread those mornings when the stars still glitter and dance, when we stalk down our drive like unfed puppies, only to be jolted back to reality by the scorching hot coffee we were dutifully handed by just as scalding parents. <laughs> I, I, I love that ending because it, 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 it's humorous, but it's also absolutely precise for, for a frosty morning but how we start a poem is really important because the the first line is the way we draw the reader into a poem and you start with an exclamation and I think that's a really good way of doing it oh I dread those mornings you know and the reader really wants to hear the next line after that and, and what comes after that is much more um, figurative and um, um, engaging imagery you know the, you talk about um, the stars glittering and dancing um and then that lovely simile um stalking down the drive was it like unfed puppies yeah the dogs oh it's, it's great you know because you, you can just see it in your mind um and then the scalding coffee and the scalding parents which is just it's just it's fun and it really works i think great Thank you. Excellent. Right, we've got five minutes left. So if there was anyone else who was keen to to share, then I'd be delighted to hear it because uh, this is such good fun here. I'll give you a couple of minutes to think. Or again, if you just want to put it in the chat and I'll read it out. Oh, Palomino Blackwind is a cult pencil, believe it or not. Oh. I write with a Puro Toga propelling pencil from Japan. And these, these are our tools as writers, remember. It's really important to think about things like that. You know, whether you use a, a keyboard or a pencil or a pen and a notebook, they're our tools. We should cherish them. 
aluminum black thing. Throwing that down as well. Okay, nobody else. Well, I think we're just about at the end of our time anyway, so I'll stop sharing. And really just to recap, I think, is all we need to do. So what else should we be doing if we're wanting to use voice and, and, and language, and dialect language in our poetry? The key one is listening. When you're a writer, you don't just travel through the world, but you're observing it and you're noting it down. So I'm always encouraging people that if you're sitting on the bus going to school, if you're walking through a shop and standing at a counter, if you're in a cafe, hear the way other people speak. And if it's interesting, write down the way they speak as well. Keep a note of it. You always keep your um, Palomino Blackwing and your Moleskin notebook at hand and take a note of the way real people speak in the real world and let that in invest your poetry as well. It's really important. The way your parents speak, the way your siblings speak or your classmates, you know, the, the words they use and how they put the words together. Because the other thing is, if you're writing a poem which is in the direct voice of someone else, you don't really need to stick to the grammar. Remember how so many of you today were repeating words and repeating phrases. That's the way people really speak when they're speaking face to face without thinking about it. You know. The other thing to do is research. You know, there are many nice um, dictionaries of the Scots language or dictionaries of the English language, whichever dialect you want, look at the books and see what words you can you can use. I mean, one of the greatest proponents of Lalins of Scots poetry was Hugh McDermott, and he used the dictionary all the time. Jameson's dictionary was, was his go-to book when he was writing poetry, to find those words that he hadn't known before. Um, the third thing to do is to practice. And I, I can't emphasize this one too much that to, to write, writing is like, it's like jogging, say, you know, if you want to, if you want to run a half marathon, what do you do? You practice. Uh, there's no good sitting thinking about running and hoping that that'll get you fit. There's no good thinking about writing either. Do the writing and your writing will surely improve. Oh, who's this? Kathleen. Oops, I'm seeing the friend of Jen H, Jen Hadfield. <laughs> oh, Moniac Moore. Well, of course, I've got Moniac Moore. I've been there many times. Um, anyway, have a think about voice and dialect in your poetry. I love the way that so many of you used your own specific words. And I've been sitting here writing down your words as you read these poems out because they're words that I hadn't heard before and I'd forgotten. Um, so I've been writing them down. But final thing that I'll say, poetry isn't just about the, way, the things that you say, about what's being said. Equally importantly is how those things are being said. So it's the, 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 the message and the way that message is put over are equally important in poetry. And the voice is your way of handling that difficulty of using language in poetry. And it is difficult. It's your voice it becomes as a poet. And in a way, it's your signature on the page and your Copyright, if you like, for your own verse is the way that you manipulate the language in your poetry. It's so, so important. Well, I'd just like to thank everyone for all their hard work this afternoon. And um, um, I hope you, you've been a little bit inspired to write in voice. I certainly have been. So I'll be going off and looking at my Scots poems that I'm working on at the moment after this. Uh, thank you all so much. <laughs>